Robin Hood Radio and the Robin Hood Radio Network is proud to present Leonard Lopate at Large, lively hour-long in-depth discussions providing overviews and context to topics usually covered in partial measures. His guests include leading thinkers, scientists, artists, economists, farmers, historians, authors, and politicians. Mr. Lopate is a Peabody Award winner whose numerous honors include three Associated Press Awards and three James Beard Awards. Welcome to Leonard Lopate at Large. I'm Leonard Lopate. In 1978 and 79, Mark Allen Stamity produced McDoodle Street, a very funny weekly comic strip for the Village Voice about life and art in New York City. It featured, among others, Malcolm Frazzle, a Greenwich Village poet suffering from writer's block who's always fa- facing or racing to meet a deadline for a publication called Dishwasher Monthly. Mr. Stamity is also the creator of the long-running comic strip Washington and the 12-episode 1985 Showtown Network television series that was based on it. And from 2001 to 2004, he drew a monthly comic strip in the New York Times Book Review called Books, B-O-O-X, that made fun of publishing trends. A new 40th anniversary edition of McDoodle Street has just been published by the New York Review of Books and brings award-winning cartoonist and illustrator Mark Allen Stamity to our show. Welcome. Thank you. There's also there's a great photograph of you doing an Elvis impersonation <laughs> for, for Bill Clinton in the Oval Office. How did that come about? Um, well, it was when Elvis first happened, when I was eight years old, he kind of changed my life. And from when I was a little kid, I, I was doing an Elvis impersonation. And I actually wrote a kid's book about it called Shake, Rattle, and Turn That Noise Down. Mm-hmm. And um, and then, uh, but anyway, as an adult, at some point I was at a at a party with friends and and uh, my my friend who was the host had some electric guitars and mics and i said do you know any elvis and um so they they started i started singing it and they started playing and then we started doing some shows we were mostly cartoonists and we would put on these shows and um and i would actually uh one of the guys lou brooks came up with a name for the for the thing uh ben day and the zip tones <laughs> ben which day. if you know yeah ben day is know, an inside word yeah, yeah ben day is zip tone and zip tone yeah. and ben day in the days when when printing was was different if you wanted to have a um a half tone you'd have these uh, these little dotted things that you'd put on that's what, so they were both the same thing i wrote a song that nobody will understand the joke anymore Put a 65 screen with an 85 screen. That's a moray. <laughs> that's they created right. moray a pattern. Moray. Right, right, right. Yeah. I get it. Yeah, yeah. So we were. So anyway, I so I perf- I did with my Elvis a lot of uh, a lot, and then when I was doing Washington, the Washington Post used to give a a party once a year, a small party upstairs on the ninth floor for a kind of intimate for a group of cartoonists and and guests they brought and also they'd have a few politicians come like whoever was you know so um and one year they had al gore and in those days i i knew al gore anyway and and uh but at after we would eat um the the there was a tradition of the cartoonists would start telling funny stories and things and and um and then it became a tradition that at the end of that I would do my Elvis, and that mm-hmm. would. And Meg Greenfield, my editor, always called it the benediction. <laughs> so, so anyway, when Al Gore saw me do it that time, and then lo and behold, two years later, in the middle of in 1993, in the middle of a um, this huge snowstorm, that was when our our our, uh, our dinner was going to be. But it was like this just massive snowstorm. So, and and. One of the guests who always came, his his um, girlfriend worked in the White House, and and so we were invited to come visit the president. It was like March 1993, and um, we spent an hour with him, and, and he was in a sweater and whatever, dealing with Bosnia intermittently, and um, and then at some point Al Gore came in, and then at some point Al Gore said, in his lifetime, Elvis only visited the White House once, but he's here among us today. So that was kind of my cue. So I took off my tie and jacket, rolled up my collar, and 
there you are. That's it. That's how it all uh, happened. The time Elvis was there was for Richard Nixon. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, I'm assuming your parents were the ones who said, turn that noise down. My mother, specifically. Uh, God bless her. She's great. She's going to be 100 May 15th, wow. actually. But, uh, yeah, God bless her. But she couldn't. back then, she couldn't stand Elvis. Uh, but both of your parents were artists. Uh, yeah. Your father, Stanley Stamati, was... Stamati, uh, actually. Stamati yeah. was a professional gag cartoonist. Yeah. And, and he mother... got my mother into it, too. And so she did, like... They, they were you know they were in the magazines of 40s, 50s, 60s of, uh, like, Saturday Evening Post, Look, Colliers, all those kind of magazines. The New Yorker was kind of the unattainable, although they mm -hmm. would buy gags from my father sometime. And my, my mother was a, a gag cartoonist who did teenage cartoons, her specialty, and she had a character, Sitter Sue. And, and Anyway, they were in all the magazines. How old were you when you realized that you wanted to follow in their footsteps? Career? Okay, so here's the story. My father, when I was in my crib, leaned over my crib and a pencil <laughs> fell out of his uh, shirt pocket. And the next morning, I'd drawn all over the sheets. So my mother kept <laughs> that. So they still have the... The the uh, they still have that sheet. Did you begin as a gag cartoonist? Like um, no, I ne I never really got the gag cartoon gene first. I made some kind of awful gag cartoons when I was a teenager for a while, but uh, when I was a kid, a little maybe a little bit. But really, what it was, I grew up looking at. We had tons of books of gag cartoons, so I would I would read all those and I'd read comic strips, etc. But basically, when I was fourteen. I, I found um, excuse me I found Jules Pfeiffer's six six six, and that was like a revelation. And I realized that I I wanted to do narratives, and that and 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 that was such an innovative book. It just opened up to me the possibilities of of what cartooning could be. And one of the uh, the commenters on this new edition of McDoodle Street has described it as almost a graphic novel. In yeah, well, Stone. I call it, well, I wrote it as a graphic novel, although I called so it. So you knew what you were going to be doing well, six I was months right, down the line? Um, no, what happened, no, I, I, I see, from, from when I was a teenager, I wanted to write novels, and uh, I wanted to write novels with pictures, and, and uh, so when I started doing this, this, uh, this strip in The Voice, it, I always intended it to be a novel as well as, a, as you know, and I didn't know the term graphic novel, I called it a comic strip novel, and um, so basically I started somewhere, and, um, and, and, and I, you know, uh, over time, I didn't see that far ahead, and when I was about halfway through or so, or a little bit, I, I started to know where I was headed, but uh, basically I wanted to sort of discover my way, um, which I think, you know, I, 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 I think that's a good way to approach a story, um, at least for a good portion of it. Um, I know there's some writers who believe in knowing exactly where you're headed, and I don't know if that's, you know, sometimes I, uh, sometimes that works. I don't know, but I, I, I did it a different way. Didn't McDoodle Street begin as panoramic centerfold cartoons of Greenwich Village and Times Square for the Village well, Voice? Well, yeah, what happened? She sold uh, them as posters? Yeah, they, the, the voice. What happened, um, I basically... Uh, I'd been doing children's books. I, I illustrated a book, Yellow, Yellow, that's actually it's going to be reissued this summer by Drawn and Quarterly. And I, so and you're then getting I, a lot of reissues yeah, now. I'm getting reissues. And McDoodle, you know, and then Which I did. Which is good for some, because if you, if you look on Amazon at some of the older books, uh, some of them are selling for over $150. Well, somebody want, the, the next book I did is the one I wrote and illustrated, Who Needs Donuts? Mm -hmm. And that actually, it was out of print for a number of years. And, and uh, Knopf Random House brought it back for its 25th uh, no for its 30th anniversary prior just prior to that i'd sold one over amazon for 500 dollars. Wow. yeah people people would come to me anyway so i was doing people kids books book. thank you and thank you and it and it and at some point um i i i felt like i wanted a an adult audience and i'd been a fan of the voice because of pfeiffer and everything for a long time and then the voice was starting to evolve, I mean, in a way that I thought um, maybe I could uh, do something there. So then I approached them with the idea of wanting to do a regular feature, and I told them also, at that point, they, they had this centerfold that they were doing different things with each week. So I said, I want to do a, um, a drawing of Greenwich Village in the style of Who Needs Donuts for mm -hmm. your centerfold. So I did that, and, um, and then I did another one um, f of Times Square, 
And at that, right around that time, they, after the first one, they gave me a little strip in the, in the paper that started out in the front, but then ended up in the classifieds. But then two cartoonists left, and there were two openings there. And um, so, so they, they said, you know, if you, if you got something, let us know. And I, so I, I took about two weeks, pulled it together, and, um, and there was McDoodle Street. And you were living on McDougal? I was living on McDougal between 3rd and Bleecker. I lived there from 1968 to 1990, a fourth-floor walk-up railroad flat, and eventually I got the, the one next door, too, with a door between them. And uh, it, was a great, it was a great place to be for many years. Yeah. You said Tom Robbins, a novel by Tom Robbins, was one of your inspirations yeah. at the start. Um, yeah, another roadside attraction. When Yellow Yellow first came out, I got a letter – from a young woman named Joan Vigliotta in Florida who worked in a bookstore, and she just she wrote me this letter about she just loved Yellow Yellow and on and on. So anyway, then, then every year on my birthday, she would send me a birthday present. <laughs> and uh, one year, she sent me Tom Robbins' Another Roadside Attraction. And I read that novel at the time. I loved that novel. And I, 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 I just felt like, you know, this is, this is the genre that just some insane, you know, insane comic novel this is the genre that i i'm i've been aiming toward so one week strip would be about an ongoing battle between irate businessmen and bearded beatniks for control of a the Greenwich cafe Village Fizz, coffee shop. yeah <laughs> the, the the cafe that you uh it was kind of it was based on the figaro but i used to work in cafe um, fizz fizz cafe fizz i used to i used to um write my strips in cafes so you know the sign in the cafe fizz in one of your uh strips uh is uh gentlemen are required to wear a beard or long mustache <laughs> neckties are prohibited right. and you could rent beards when you when you came in now also the uh, the, the you might have one about uh a plot involving a genetically engineered dishwashing monkey uh, you also had one uh, one about visions of a of a soothsayer on the bus were these inspired by things that you uh, well obviously no dishwasher monkey but uh, dishwashing yeah. is a theme throughout these well it was these. a well it came together i guess from a lot of different directions it was all part of this ultimately it was part of the same storyline but um i you know early on um, when I first came to the city, I, I used to take long walks at night. I'd sometimes start about, um, say, 11 o'clock at night, and I'd, I'd walk till maybe 3 a.m. or so. And, I, and, uh, and if I was on 105th Street and I wanted to you know, come back home, I'd just, I'd just walk home you know, in the middle of the night. And I basically, but I would, I, I, we had a teacher at Cooper Union named Ben Cunningham. He was an op artist. He called himself a visual voluptuary. And in those days, I was something of a lost soul, but I knew I wanted to do something in this work. And I and you didn't the, want to paint. Uh, well, no, I wanted to. I wanted to make art. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I, I mean, um, I, I I can't say that I had exactly defined what I wanted to do. But the but the thing was, um, I I I basically um, these walks at night were kind of intuitively guided. Um, the notion of visual voluptuary was kind of a, a helpful notion, but I was, I would basically feel as if I was kind of mystically guided hmm. to just, just soak in, you know, imagery to soak in the city, soak in characters, <clears throat> excuse me. And my, um, I, w I would say, you know, my book who needs, I always had a sketchbook with me, my book who needs donuts, um, the, um, the the story basically one night I was in a Bickford's coffee shop my third year in Cooper Union there was a, an old woman lying kind of lying across the counter and it kind of seemed like she was asleep a guy came in he said he wants two cups of two cups of coffee to go and the waitress said would you like donuts with your coffee he said no thank you and the old lady lifted up her head pointed at the ceiling and said that's right who needs donuts when you've got love so I wrote that in my sketchbook, and eventually I made a book out of it. There was a night I met a guy named Eddie. Um, on He was on St. Mark's Place, and uh, he, he had this old mattress, and he was trying to sleep on this old mattress. that it was, He was over by where the electric circus used to be, and he was, it was like 2 o'clock in the morning. I don't know. And uh, I started – anyway, at some point I started talking to the guy, and I, I basically kind of heard his life story, and um, – he was a, it was a really interesting story. I used to, you know, have these, I used to talk to a lot of these kind of people and take in things. So it was, 
I was, and then I, use them. Yeah, I use them, or or they would also they also would set off my imagination. So every you know it's it's kind of a, you get into a zone about it, and and if the you know and, and I was looking for a kind of a craziness, a kind of a, the I mean I <clears throat> I was fascinated by the city. I was fascinated by you know potentially comic elements and poignant elements. So the so basically Eddie in Who Needs Donuts is the ultimate guru, and he basically appears to be what we used to call a bowery bum he's lying on his back in the you know basically near the bowery and um and helga parsnip who (laughs) is a bag lady that malcolm has met on the um on the bus who who tells his fortune by putting her hand on his ear and looking into an empty whiskey bottle and sees his future um she she uh had made a connection early on with um, Eddie, the uh, who uh, Eddie Reddy, the um, the the uh, her basically her guru, and he had been a dishwasher for many years, and eventually he would had a vision of Rebecca the cow, who is the <laughs> deity of McDoodle Street, and and the and he came to understand the deep wisdom of dishwashing, and um, and then um, Malcolm Frazzle, you know, was writing these poems about dishwashing. And um, it turned out that destiny had a mission for him. And um, why, I just I say why, why, you know, to me it was this kind of intuitive thing about dishwashing, the notion of it as a meditative um, kind of a pro, um, process that could, um, could bring uh, inner wisdom. My guess is Mark Allen Stavity, whose cartoons, illustrations, covers, and comics uh, have appeared in Time Magazine, The New Yorker, Harper's, The New Republic, New York, GQ, and many other magazines and newspapers. And the 40th anniversary edition of his McDoodle Street cartoons has just been published by New York Review of Books with some additional material. We'll get into that in a little bit. This is Leonard Lopate at large on WBAI, New York, 99.5 FM. How autobiographical is the character of Malcolm Frazzle? He's always uh, facing a deadline. Did you always feel the pressure <laughs> kind of because you had to turn out a, um, a cartoon? I have week? to say that was that was quite autobiographical. And um, and uh, in um, in McDoodle Street, there's a lot that's autobiographical. Just be, just before I began uh, working on McDoodle Street, I had a beard and um, and those. I had a beard and those old kind of, um, horn, are they horn rim glasses? Is that what they call them? You know, the black plastic things like the old Woody Allen glasses. Mm-hmm. So I had those, you know, that's what I looked like for, for nine years. And just before I started doing McDoodle Street, I shaved my beard and I got these wire rim glasses. So I was drawing, Malcolm looked like what I had just previously looked like. And sometimes I would appear in the comic strip as me with, you know, looking like, you know, my beardless self. And, um, yeah, I would say um, there. The, Malcolm, you know, had a crush on Brenda Fun, a, a cheerleader. I have to say that that I had a similar experience. Um, I, I, you know, I've kept diaries uh, all my adult life. Malcolm uh, um, did keep a diary. I did write a poem about that cheerleader. Um, Malcolm wrote a poem about his, the cheerleader. There are many things. My father was not, but my father was not an appliance repairman. <laughs> I'm assuming that some of the other characters with these great names, Fred Mello, Miss Bitely, Doris Drainpipe, Gussiv Ranto, were all based on real people as well. Well, I have to admit, I, 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 I have to admit, you know, Gustav Ranto was 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 kind of me in a way, too. You know, I, I, I hoped I hoped to be a, a great art genius and um and you know there were some disappointments. I didn't drink as much cappuccino as he drinks, and I didn't. I didn't. Uh, uh, I didn't have the breakdowns that he had. But um, but yes. but you opened the book with seven comic strips about Herbert Hippo. Yeah. Well, that was the little strip I had in the beginning, and I and and Herbert was actually Herbert was going to be, he was going to be active. <coughs> excuse me. In the. Um, in the border of the comic strip in an ongoing basis. But it happened that right around that time, um, Playboy magazine started having this comic section, and a bunch of us cartoonists were, um, were called to action there. And Playboy wanted to run Herbert Hippo, so, so then they wanted to not have it be in the voice. So, <clears throat> but, but Herbert Next appears— Next to Little Annie Fanny? 
Um, it actually there was another section that had that it was sort of a separate section. I think maybe Annie Fanny was in the same I, same thing, but I think it was a next, it was a separate section. I know Art Spiegelman had one, and and uh, and Bobby London had had one, and and you know Dirty Duck was in there, and uh, sorry anyway, Herbert Hippo was in there, and so Herbert Hippo ran for they 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 reprinted a few of those. And then they told me they wanted to own the character of Herbert, and I said no. So then that was that was the end of that. You mentioned that you <laughs> stuck a lot of stuff into each strip. Uh, there's lots of details, and and each has a title and a subtitle. Uh, examples of some of the subtitles: the comic strip that knows how to use a fork. Yeah, sal- com- no, 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 no. The comic strip. That knows how to identify a salad fork. Oh, okay. <laughs> Critical. Comic strip that graduated from Long Branch High School. Yep. The ticklish comic strip. The comic strip that never met Leonid Brezhnev. So on top of all the characters, should we? Should I assume that the comic strip itself was a character? Yeah, the comic strip became a character in the comic strip and actually at a certain point went out and got drunk in the comic strip and... Uh, and um, had um, yeah, the comic strip went through a few of its own struggles. Um, the uh, a lot of a, a lot of the things still are relevant today, but some of the jokes may be lost on younger people. For example, we talked about how you couldn't wear a necktie uh, at Cafe Fizz. The necktie becomes a symbol for the CLF, the Conservative Liberation Front. Yeah, there was, well, back when, I guess a lot of younger people don't know, there was a National Liberation Front in Viet- North Vietnam, and there was the uh, the the Palestinian Liberation Front. And um, so basically, you know, in that time, at that time, Jimmy Carter was the president, uh, and, and, and I don't think... Uh, I don't think anybody really expected there'd be a big, uh, you know, uh, kind of conservative move into the White House with Ronald Reagan. At the time I started, there was no hostage crisis. Um, Jimmy Carter was doing pretty well in the polls, I think, at the time I I began it. But anyway. That's um, before OPEC. uh, No, it was after OPEC. The OPEC, I think, was early 70s. But it was – but it – but – Basically, the Iranian hostage crisis is kind of, you know, and then and then Ted Kennedy ran against Jimmy Carter, calling him a Republican. And that really. uh, But anyway, um, so so, um, yeah, so it was a conservative liberation front and they um, they refused to remove their neckties when they barged into the cafe fizz and they refused to rent a beard. And they are Wayne Newton fans. Uh, Wayne do you Newton think fans. anyone under thirty even knows who Wayne <laughs> Newton is? Yeah, see, that's funny because I, I see when I was a kid, Wayne Newton was a child star, and he used to go on Ed Sullivan, and he used to sing the corniest songs. I thought, and I was just never, I never was a Wayne. I was, a, I was into R and B. I was into soul music and Elvis and Jerry Lee Lewis and all this. And Wayne Newton just seemed like a corny guy to me and so anyway so these and 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 i didn't know by the way that in the the as it turned out in the 1980 republican convention that nominated ronald reagan wayne newton performed and i didn't know i had no idea of his politics but basically the conservative liberation front one of their demands was that the cafe fizz play five hours a day of of um wayne newton songs and Malcolm Frazzle did not like Wayne Newton, and he kind of made an indiscreet remark that, that got him in, in, in difficulty with the CLF. So you started to get into political issues even then. This even then, Washington. although I was, I was really, you know, that I, 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 I did, but I was, um, I was, I, I hadn't gone, um, I hadn't gone full blast. It was kind of, you know, a, an element. It was only uh, eventually that I was invited to do politics for the Washington Post, and then, um, and then, you know, eventually got deeper into it. At that time, it was, it, yeah, I definitely had political feelings, um, but. But it, you know, McDougal Street is um, arguably not a heavily political strip. I was wondering while I was thinking about our conversation, uh, just how we were going to get around the fact that they are your cartoons are just so visual and so packed with <laughs> all sorts of interesting drawings and ideas. Uh, so uh, I'm encouraging all of our listeners: if you don't have the book. Go to the internet and look look up Mark Allen Stavity and look up 
uh, McDoodle Street or or some of the later or ones. Or they could even go this... to a bookstore and yeah. buy lots of copies. Yes. Well, actually, you're <laughs> going to be at McNally's. Uh, McNally for... Jackson Bookstore um, in a conversation with Leanna Fink on April 10th. I think it's a that's a it might be a Wednesday. I'm not a, sure. A, a book party. But um, yeah, it's a it's a book party. Yeah, book party. It's a well. She's. I guess she's going to talk with me about um, uh, McDoodle Street. Um, I will. Yeah. Well, there are many layers in in uh, to each strip, and that's what I was alluding to. For instance, sometimes there are characters outside of the story who live in the border of the comic strip and speak. Uh, in a flashback, Malcolm's <clears throat> guidance counselor advised him against committing suicide and says, there's no future in it, Malcolm. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when Malcolm discovers poetry. <laughs> yeah, dis- yeah, if, and... Um, yeah, he wrote about um, a, a, basically he wrote about a cheerleader he was in love with named Brenda Fun, and um, it was unrequited love initially. Now I, I don't want to make any spoilers, but but he did encounter Brenda eventually again, um, with more positive um, experience. But um, b- uh, now now I'm trying to it w- now I'm trying to remember where I was with the, uh, you said oh. But he uh, he's dissuaded from committing <clears throat> suicide. Oh, I was going to talk poetry. about the border. What I was going to talk about, you were talking yeah, about the border. borders. Yeah, we. I went to Cooper Union, and at the time I went to Cooper Union, um, there there was not a lot of focus on commercial art in any way. It was very much kind of a fine art school, and I, so I spent a lot of time in. Um, and I think that was a good thing for me. Um, so the streets of New York were a big influence. <laughs> And also, um, and Cooper Union is so well located for the kind of thing you were doing. Oh, it's fun, it's wonderful. Astor Place, right? Astor Place, right in the middle of everything. So it was, it was a wonderful place to be, um, and and also um, uh, because there was such a fine art kind of a push, I I spent a lot of time in museums, Metropolitan Museum, a lot of places, and I looked at many other kinds of art. And I, and when I did McDoodle Street, I wanted to experiment with the form of a comic strip. And I also wanted to bring other elements to it that maybe hadn't been there before. So these, so I had these kind of freezes around the, around the strip, different things that were inspired by, you know, all kinds of um, art that I'd see in the museums that I'd see in books that I, you know, that, um, and, and, you know, I just wanted, I wanted to Make I wanted to kind of come at a comic strip from the outside of the com of comic strips and just you know make it something that it hadn't been. So so I tried to bring other elements then. And occasionally you put special offers into the strip. For example, there's a free gift for cut out face and forehead wrinkles. Yeah, where yeah, did that, that come from? Uh, <laughs> well, it was well from my oops from my mind but um basically you know there there were um young people that didn't seem to have a lot of gravitas um i offered um these wrinkles that they could glue on their their face and their forehead and and uh cheeks so they would have more gravitas and and be taken more seriously and there's also an opportunity to shake hands with Malcolm Frazzle if you have an exacto knife. And I don't think that ever happened in the history of comic strips. You, it, I don't think anybody ever shook hands with Ali Oop or Little Abner. So, so Malcolm offered um, um, a, a more personal experience. And I'm, I suspect you were thinking, hey, what can I do that nobody else has done? I wanted to, yeah. I wanted to just, you know, it seemed like <clears throat> it seemed like a comic strip could be a lot more, it could be a lot... It, I mean that that in some way there's no limit to to to, to w- what it could be. I, I was trying, at least I was trying to explore those things and the notion that it's it's an organism, um, and and um, so that so then I felt like the possibilities were infinite and I tried to, you know, find as many of them as I could, in the given year and a half that I did it, <laughs> and have fun. I and have fun. Yeah. Exactly. How old were you at the time? Um, let's see. So I'd have to subtract. I was, um, 78. So I was born in 1947. So I was 31, 32 in the years I was doing it. And also, I'm sure you were getting a lot of positive feedback. You know, uh, I got, well, I got, I got great. Yeah. I got a wonderful feedback. It was really, uh, it was really fun because, um, when I was doing children's books, there was, there was kind of, um, a limit to um, to what I could put in 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 you know in a kid's book, even though I 
and 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 so when I so in McDoodle Street, I could I could get a lot more in it, and I could and I could get a real appreciation from um, from yeah, it was a wonderful any the appreciation I got. At one point, you apologized to your readers for losing control of the strip. I'm quoting. Yeah, the characters uh, got out. I'm beginning to lose control of my characters. I did not want the quiche to be destroyed. I had hoped that the comic strip would be thoroughly nonviolent. <laughs> Pretty terrifying, huh? Yeah, imagine imagine yourself sitting there with that pen and it's out of control. <laughs> We're back with Mark Allen Saturday, whose McDoodle Street uh, has just been issued uh, in an... And, uh, a new version or a new edition by the New York Review of Books. And this time it's in hardcover. Now, what so. was uh, what led to that? Was it just somebody realized that it was uh, 40 years the, uh, in time to uh, to do a 40-year edition? N- I, it didn't exactly happen that way. It was uh, I got an email from, um, from New York Review Comics from a man named Lucas Adams, and he and, um, and um, a man, uh, Gabriel, and I'm, I, I, I have to, I have to, anyway, Gabriel, they, they started um, New York Review Comics at New York Review of Books. And, um, and they, they inquired about uh, two, two strips that I'd done. This, there was a very experimental strip that I did after McDoodle Street, and also there was McDoodle Street, and they wanted to see both of them. They had started a thing of, of uh, reprinting um, old comic books or old comic uh, graphic novels, etc., so they were interested, and they'd been. Um, I think the first person that that um, told them about it. Oh, you have to pardon me; his, his name's not coming to mind. But anyway, they were told about it by several people, and uh, so we met, and I I dropped off all this stuff, and they and so they decided uh, they wanted to reprint McDoodle Street. So that's that's essentially how it happened. You write about your readers in one of the strips. A quote. He's young and on the move, doing things, meeting people, chewing gum, starting fights with bus drivers. The kind of person you can be if you read the aforementioned comic strip. Yeah, that was, well, that, Playing I think that with was your readers. typical reader, I guess. And it had... Did you meet many of your readers? Um, I met a lot of them, yeah. They, were, they weren't all arguing with bus drivers, actually. I don't know if I... I, I might have made that up. Malcolm writes for Dishwasher Monthly. <laughs> Where did that come from? Why it dishwasher? It came basically, you know, I it's sat down. I was, the strip. It came from, yeah, it came from um, I, basically, um, the, um, it came from the excitement of the, of the notion that I could have a comic strip in the village voice. And I, and I basically sat down to work on it. And, and, um, and the next thing I knew I was, putting my characters in a cafe and basically it just naturally started developing. And then there was Malcolm. He looked a lot like I used to look like, and he was struggling to write a poem. And, and, um, basically as I, as I wrote it, uh, things occurred to me. And then, um, and then as, as I moved along, well, I've got a guy who's writing poetry about, uh, about dishwashing for Dishwasher Monthly, so where's this headed, you know? So I basically found my way, um, you know, step by, panel by panel, step by step. McDoodle Street started to wind down in 1977, and a final strip announces a leave of absence. Yeah. Are you expected to come back? I expected to come back, um, but I, I had realized over time, um, and I'll say this, you know, um, Lucas and Gabe said to me, um, we really, a lot, it never did come back. So Lucas and Gabe said to me, um, would you, um, we, we would like you to, would you mind writing, uh, an addendum of some sort that would tell what happened? You know, how come McDoodle Street never came back? And that happened to have been a very significant period of my life, my creative process, et cetera. And, um, so I, so at the end of the book, I wrote a, and drew a, a 20 page comic strip addendum that tells that story. And essentially, um, as I was, as I worked on the strip over a year and a half, it gradually 
kind of took over my my life there was i i wanted it to be good so so then it's like if 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 people would say oh this week's strip was funny i i you know sometimes i'd say well what how did i do that what did i you know and how am i gonna be funny again and over and so the you know essentially there was a whole i realized that over time it was not um really a sustainable thing that i to approach in the way i was approaching it but you write, McDoodle Street is the closest I ever got to the direction I wanted to go with my work. The kind of, well, I wanted to make these crazy graphic novels, basically, which is right now I'm working on a couple of graphic novels. But basically, um, yeah, I, I want, and now doing them week to week to a newspaper deadline, is what I found isn't the best way to do, to do, you know, like, for instance, you get to a certain point halfway through a story and you might realize, well, gee, if I could go back, you know, to, mm. to you know, and, and fix this, then, then it's you could, better. If you're writing a manuscript, but yeah, you can't do it you, if you you've already published. You can't do it that way if you've already published. Now, there's a good thing about it because you've committed, you know, and you gotta you got to go from where you are. And that's, in some ways, that's a great thing, but not, for me, not, you know, not for, um, to do um, a, a lot of, books you know it was like it was it was great that I could do do that strip that way that time but it did kind of take over my life because I didn't want to mess up so I would kind of like set aside my life to to make sure I didn't mess up and you you say that you had a revelation about the work that you wanted to do in the months after you stopped doing McDoodle Street didn't have to do with the not only the end of the ship, but uh, losing your father. My yeah, my father died. The day, it was it was it was very. Um, I don't know. Uh, um, it seemed it seemed like it was almost um, synchronized. My my father. I a, after I finished McDoodle Street, there were two weeks in which I did the cover and the, all the extra parts for the book, and then I because I'd already, I'd had the book contract for quite a while exactly in the hour that I was delivering the the all the materials for the book, September uh, 12th, 1979, between 3 and 4 p.m. That's when my father died, exactly then. And it felt like he'd, it felt like he'd waited. I mean, we, we weren't, you know, that, we weren't talking that day. He didn't, but it felt like somehow we were connected and he waited till I was ready to deal with it. And, um, and then I went through a, a period where I tried to write McDoodle Street again, but I just wasn't in that place. And it was about six months um, that I that I just was kind of lost. But what about the characters? When something like that comes to an end, do the characters and the voices just disappear? Um, it, well, it was, you know... Because I, I once you know. wrote a novel, and even when I stopped uh, you know, working on any day, I was going to the supermarket, mm -hmm. voices would suddenly... Uh, come to me and I'd have to stop in the middle of the street and write things <laughs> down. Well, I'd say that Malcolm Frazzle and Helga Parsnip and, and uh, Hugo, the deli man, and all those characters are very alive to me and um, they're very real to me. Um, but, but the, the, this, I just need, it was, it was time to go to, to another place. And I really had to let go and, and, um, yeah, I can I can tell about what happened to me, how I, I went to the next place. Well, you had a number of different things happen. Yeah, a f well, a few things. There was well, a column. There was Time Magazine. Um, oh, oh, since oh, that was yeah. Later, I did well. That was much later. Time Magazine. I oh. b basically um, what happened at that point after McDoodle Street was I I uh, I ended up after about six months doing some some work just for myself where I would just kind of go into a zone and 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 do these comic strips that I I did them just to enjoy doing them. I didn't know where I was headed with them. I had and I used to walk around with them in, a, in my my uh, chocolate soup bag if you remember what that was and uh, and there was a woman that I was dating at the time and I I didn't want anybody to see them because I'd become very self-conscious about what will people think at that point. I didn't you know is it funny isn't it funny and and um, eventually I showed it to this woman I was dating and she uh, she liked them, which astonished me. And then a, I ran into a voice copy editor, showed her and she liked them. And she said, you should take this to back to the David at the voice. And, um, and, and I went to David at the voice, the editor, and, and he said, great, when do you want to come back? And so I did this experimental strip for a year that was, that was very different from anything I'd ever done, both visually and verbally. And then that was you just change your drawing style. Um, well, I, I certainly, 
expanded my drawing style. I drew, I mean, I just really wanted to break out of everything I had been doing and work much differently. And it was a, it was a year into that, that McDoodle Street was published the first time. And, and it turned out Meg Greenfield, editorial page editor of the Washington Post had been following all my strips in the voice and, and, uh, McDoodle Street got this great review in the Washington Post. It had the conservative liberation front there. Mm-hmm. And then she called me up and wanted me to do a McDoodle Street version of Washington, which I then ended up doing for many years. It's starting in 1981. Yeah, it was in the starting, Village Voice and the Washington Post. It was in Post. The Voice, the and, Washington Post. It wound Post. up in 40, 40 uh, It was syndicated in 40 newspapers. First it was syndicated sort of because papers would call me, and then the Washington Post picked it up and they syndicated it. And it was called Washing Tune. Washing Tune, yeah, with Congressman Bob Forehead. Now that was it, that saved you to some degree because in the uh, they added material to the the new publication, to McDoodle, McDoodle Street. Street. The you tell McDoodle Jules Street. Pfeiffer that you feel like you're destroying your career. Right. Well, Jules, Jules, we were at the Voice Christmas party when I was doing those ex- very experimental strips. I mean, I did strips about my father's death. I did ex- I did strips that were very silly, very stream of consciousness, all kinds of I mean, it was it was different every week. It was often very different panel to panel. And Jules at the at the Christmas party, Voice Christmas party, he said, "I really admire what you're doing. It's very brave." And I, this meant a lot to me because he was my hero, and uh, I, and now he is my colleague, of course. And and um, I said uh, I thanked him, and then I said I feel like I'm destroying my career. And Jules said to me, "That's how you should feel every time you sit down to your drawing board," mm-hmm. which which I knew exactly what he meant. No, so Washington commented on politics of the day. Yeah. Do you regret the fact that you're not doing it now because there's so much rich material? Um, well, you know, yes and no. I don't. It's it's. Um, I I'd say there there's there's rich material, and maybe if I got the right offer, it would it would be in, intriguing. But it's um, it's also creatively, it wasn't everything I wanted to do. You know, there's a, there's a certain world you're in in politics. You you know, you take in a lot of painful information and um and you but you're there there you know it's um in 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 some ways that that um canvas is is more limited than than the kind of thing i i really wanted to do well right now we rely on the late night talk shows yeah we're doing for, this brilliant for the uh, the comedy brilliant in, in work done but uh it seems to me that uh, a, a cartoon could cover all sorts of things that they can't. Cover. Well, I, you know, there's somebody made a, uh, made a bit of an offer recently. Some, I mean, I got some, a couple of, actually, a couple of feelers about it, and I'm thinking about about doing um, Even if you don't Washington have to, again. You don't have to do it every week. Yeah, yeah, no, I could do it I, exactly. I know, I, 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 I would want to still approach it in a a little different way than than how I have approached it. But um, yeah, I mean, I certainly. Um, I certainly have, you know, I, like I said, I've kept diaries for, for, since I was in high school and, um, and I write a lot of rage in my diaries about our political situation these days. Now, have, are you one of those people who notices how much influence you've had on others? Because your work at that point was kind of like a breakthrough. It was unlike anything else. Well, it was unlike anything else I appreciate that. Was being that done. Maybe much. Art Spiegelman to some degree, but uh, well, I'd say that I, I see I see work that I think is definitely influenced by my work. But it's um, you know we all have influences, so I you know it's um, it, you know. Um, it's not it it that's one of those things where people outside of me have to basically tell me what they think or tell the world what they think. I you know. One of your books for children is Aaliyah's mission, Saving the Books of Iraq. And that's based on a true story? Yeah, it was a true story. I can't remember the, the writer who a writer in the New York Times wrote the article. I'm sorry, I can't remember her her name. But uh, uh, there was one other children's book done on the same subject. But basically, um, my editors at, um, at um, Knopf Random House um, basically said to me, they, they found this article, and since I was a children's book author, illustrator, and also had, had done political cartoons for so many years, they thought I'd be the perfect person to make it into a graphic novel for children. And, and it was a really 
uh, you know, um, Elias Mission. It was the, the story of um, this um, a um, librarian in Basra, Iraq, who um, when the war, the the go, the Iraq War was about to happen, she she started um, shipping all the books out of. She got a bunch of people helping her, like from the restaurant next door, et cetera. They started moving all the books out of the library into uh, their private homes and it would, and, and they saved like 3000 or 300,000 books I think before the library eventually got bombed and burned down in the in the war which she just uh, was very concerned would happen so that was, that was a um, really beautiful powerful story and the real hero of that the, the the writer's name was something like I I would die one or something the, the the writer who did that reporting was the real hero of getting that story and do we know what happened to those books? Um, they were saved, and then and I believe she got funding to rebuild the library. Her name was uh, um, I think her name was Aaliyah Baker or Aaliyah Muhammad Baker. I don't remember exactly that offhand now her name, but they they did apparently um, rebuild the library. Wasn't there some resistance uh, to that book in Florida? I've yeah, I've heard that. I I can't say that it that it that it affected my life that yeah, much. But, what, but yeah, what would, why would they object? Well, you know, it's just there's there's I think there's just bigotry because um, it's just you know people have um, I you know I, ideas about. Um, Muslims that are um, that you know that I think are you know boil down to bigotry. I mean, because I because I think it was about you know a Muslim um, librarian being presented in a positive way that, that that somehow they didn't want children to see that. And I you know that's a, that's what what little I know about that. Your cartoons have been used in different ways as posters, as regular comic strips, as books for children, for five of them, etc. Do you adjust your drawing style for each kind of project? I have for yeah, I have for for. I mean, I've I have adjusted my drawing style for. I did a book, Where's My Hippopotamus? That's very different from my book, Mini Maloney and Macaroni. That's very different from my book, Small in the Saddle. Small in the Saddle is somewhat similar to to Who Needs Donuts, although not as intense. And that first book I illustrated that's coming out this summer with Drawn in Quarterly, Yellow, Yellow, written by Frank Ash, that was the kind of a prelude to um, my style in Who Needs Donuts, and that's the prelude to the style in the the posters I did for The Voice of Greenwich Village and Times Square, all of which was, you know, was the style for McDoodle Street. So it, 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 um, but, but there's, you know, I, I, I'd say I, I, I have a, ju- and I did the, the book Shake, Rattle and Turn That Noise Down. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that one is a, is a, if you, I mean, if you look at all those books next to each other, you definitely see, I think you'll see something that runs through, but you'll also see that a lot of them are very different in the, in the approach. You, uh, in your dedication to this book, you include a note to every single one of the nice people I've met in the offices of the Village Voice. Yeah. Now, um, the that that experience of of uh, being at the Village Voice, where I was there sixteen and a half years, in the in really wonderful years there. Um, I met so many great people. It was just a, it was like it was a home, and we had a very happy world there, and and. Um, you know, um, writing and drawing McDoodle Street and having um, the, the the all the support and the appreciation, it was wonderful. And there were, you know, there's so many creative people there, so many, and it was, and there were, you know, funny incidents, and there was, um, you know, there was, I mean, there was the time when, um, when uh, you know, Rupert Murdoch owned it at, at, one, in, at one time. Like I was about 10 strips into McDoodle Street, and suddenly um, Rupert Murdoch's, uh, the man working for him at, uh, anyway, um, fired Marianne Partridge, who was our editor at that time, before her contract had run out. And, and I remember, so, so we were threatening a big shutdown. And we were, so all of us voice people, we were there on, you know, it was on University and 11th at that time. We were up on the second floor. And, and this guy, Joel Siegel, was there from Channel 11. And he's interviewing Jack Newfield. And I remember Jack Newfield said, if Rupert Murdoch does not, um, does not honor the rest of Marianne Partridge's contract, 
No, no. If if Bill Ryan does not honor the rest of of Rupert Murdoch, of, of, if Bill Ryan, wait, does not honor the rest Bill of Ryan Marianne, was, was Murdoch's yeah, man. he was Murdoch's. He was he was a man running, you know, Uber guy at the Voice. If Bill Ryan does <laughs> not honor the rest of of Marianne Partridge's contract, Rupert Murdoch will own a parking lot. <laughs> well, actually, right now that's kind of the case yeah but did you there's, feel there's not even a parking at, lot now I did guess. people at the voice feel pressure to adjust because the voice had a reputation for being a rather liberal publication and then suddenly Rupert murdoch the man who gave us the uh, who changed the post from yeah, being the very exactly. liberal post to what it is now and to give us fox news uh he uh I, I can't Did we feel he just pressure at the voice? Off. No, he was hands off, but he was he tried he tried to be hands on some of the time. This is this is the story I heard at the time. Um, this is this is what I heard at the time was, and it may be wrong. I mean, in terms of the numbers, but I heard that the New York Post in those days was losing ten million a year. I think the Voice was earning him a million a year, so the Voice was helping to c- contribute to the Post to keep it alive. And, and what I understood then was Rupert Murdoch knew that the voice was a certain kind of species. And if he tried to turn it into one of his, you know, one of his kind of a tabloid trashy papers, um, that, that uh, it would kill it. And it, he wouldn't be making, he wouldn't be getting, you know, he bought it by accident when he, wa- he bought New York Magazine is really what he was after. And the voice came along with it at that time. Um, you know, he bought it out from under Clay Felker. But I do remember in the this is a story and i may have this i mean this is a story as i remember it i can't guarantee it but i i believe it and this is what i was told somewhere i think it was in the 80s rupert murdoch um called up david schneiderman and and insisted that he fire jack newfield who was you know writing about you know well anyway that he, he rupert murdoch was upset about a lot of things and david stood up, stood up to him so i mean they, you know um uh that that's you know I think David did did stand up to Murdoch, and and Murdoch understood the creature that he had. So, so I think generally, um, um, you know, Murdoch was was um, held at bay or just was sort of hands off. And eventually, he sold it. And I think and and the the numbers I heard, I think he uh, the the numbers as I heard them, I won't try to. He sold it for a lot more than he bought it, is what I recall. Well, in the end, it was pretty much being kept alive through classifieds and some of them yeah. rather shady I th- classifieds. Yeah, well, that, that got and really bad. And there's been a scandal yeah. connected to that. That was a terrible thing. You know what happened was in the in the in the in the eighties, there was a guy John Evans at The Voice who who before you know before there was an internet and all that you know um, there was a guy um, John Evans who was. Uh, I think he started out in the ad section, and and um, and he and he was he was a genius, as I understand it, as I, of um, of cl- marketing classified ads. They weren't they weren't those obscene things. They were just like you know he did a lot of really innovative things with classified ads, and eventually. Rupert made him the publisher of The Voice, and eventually he took him off into his magazine world, and suddenly, you know. Um, uh, this man who had been kind of a hippie was was in three piece pinstripe suits, and he was a you know he was in the so Murdoch took some talent you know from the Voice, but but in the later years and after I left the Voice, that you know there was that whole thing with with all these obscene ads and all and that that thing, and that but that and that was also you know that was by then that time it was owned by these whole other people who were not even in New York, and that was you know I mean that was. That was uh, years after I was there, so I, I can't speak to it too much. I feel that I should uh, list some of the honors and awards that you've received, just so that our audience. I object. <laughs> no, you, I, I, I'm glad. Uh, audience knows just who I've been talking to. <laughs> they include two gold medals and two silver medals from the Society of Illustrators, the Premio Sat- Satira Politica Forte. De Marmi, 2005, from the Museum of Satire and Character in... Um, Forte de Marmi, Italy. A, a page one award from the Newspaper Guild of New York. The Augustus St. Gaudens uh, Alumni Career Award from Cooper Union. Yes. Uh, so you must feel good about all I of love, that. I love, yeah. I, I mean, I, I, it's, it gives me a warm feeling to be appreciated. Yes, definitely. 
And right now you're working on a number of other projects? Yeah, I'm working on two graphic novels. Um, one is kind of a Western thing. It's because that because I grew up watching Westerns, and that kind of uh, framework is in my mind or that genre. So although it's a Western, I, I've got about that. I've got about 65 pages, six chapters, and, and it's uh, – it's not your usual western. It goes off where it wants to go. You know, it goes where it wants to go. But I. But in, the, in other words, it's going to be funny as well. Um, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> I think so. And it's kind of goes places where westerns don't usually go. I'd say, or in some ways. And then the other one is, uh, you know, like I said, I've kept diaries all my adult life. And the other one is, I've got about thirty pages, two chapters, and 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 that one is. Um, kind of a personal thing it's a novel it's a graphic novel it's i have different names and for everything and everybody but it's basically it kind of goes through my life in a more kind of serious way or certain events uh, of my life beginning with the kind of a trauma as a teenager and then how i kind of found my way and did you feel any nostalgia when you were working on the mcdoodle reissue oh i loved it i loved going back to those characters you recognize loved... the guy who did that the, who, who the guy who the guy yeah well they, that, that guy's eyes are diff- were different than <laughs> mine i mean he could i i you know i drew all the mcdoodle stuff to size and um and uh you know i i, I don't draw i don't draw that tiny um these days mm-hmm. but i would say um it was a pleasure going back to you know it's the the, the addendum starts off with the comic strip lost and drunk and uh mm-hmm. it's a you know it's a has been and and almost gets into a barroom fight until malcolm and helga save it and i you know i i i mean i love those characters and i love um mcdoodle street you know it was like i said for it's it it it, for many years i would say and it you know it was the closest i i ever got to the kind of crazy novel i wanted to write and the 40th anniversary edition of mcdoodle street has just been published by the new york review of books if you would like to meet mark allen samity uh and celebrate the book uh, on the tenth, that's just yeah, a few days April, from now. Yeah, April April tenth, McNally let's Jackson. See, today's the third. Yeah, so it's next Wednesday at McNally Jackson. I think it's seven p.m. And the brilliant original cartoonist uh, um, Leanna Fink is going to, I guess, interview me, have a conversation with me about McDoodle Street. Mark, thank you so much for being on our well, show. Well, thank you. It was a real pleasure, Leonard. And that brings us to the end of today's show. My great thanks to Kate Guan Allison who produced today's segment. Lord and Lopate at Large comes to you on Saturdays at 4 and Tuesdays at noon. You can subscribe to Leonard Lopate at Large podcast on iTunes and by clicking on Robin Hood Radio's archive program site, which is robinhoodradio.com. You can also check out Leonard Lopate at Large Facebook page. We hope to see you next week. <laughs>